Hi there. <laughs> so since this is uh, the OSCON data conference, um, I decided that what I wanted to do was explain uh, what is the data flow that Netflix has. So what is the data that, that um, that Netflix has and what open source we use to process that data. I mean, it's not all open source, but primarily um, the things we build are based on that. And um, since I'm kind of exploring a data flow, uh, I decided to use Prezi. And some of you may know what Prezi's like, but it's going to slide around a lot here. So um, this is what our data center looks like on the left. Um, it's, it blew up a year or two ago. We completely ran out of capacity, and we've been running away from it ever since. Um, so we've moved to Amazon, and this is the little Amazon Cloud Monkey um, icon, where basically we deliberately break Amazon on a continuous basis to test our, our error handling and things like that. So I'm not really going to talk about that very much today, except to say that what we have, um, since we're still running on both of them, um, a lot of the outages that Netflix has are actually because we're still trying to run on the data center and in the cloud, and we call this Roman writing. Uh, and this is what Roman riding is for those of you that don't go to rodeos every day. Um, you have one foot on each horse, and you have a pair of reins in each hand, and that's the only thing connecting these horses, and you gallop around jumping through fire and stuff. And every now and again, one of them trips, and you go flat on your face. And that's kind of running with scissors kind of thing that we're doing at the moment. Uh, I'll explain why we're, why we're running so fast. But we're trying to get off the data center and run completely on cloud so that we only have one horse and we can sit on it. That would be helpful. I uh, don't really have time to read through all this, but this, this seemed very appropriate to today's conference. Um, you know, the guys were talking about all the kinds of uh, um, sort of things that you would do if you were trying to sell a startup in the, uh, in the data world. So I, I recommend you go to Abstruse Goose if you don't manage to get through this and see it. But, uh, you know, I could go through and spend a lot of time explaining everything. Um, but I, you know, it would just be all words, and, and uh, I'm going to do this with pictures instead and maybe convey some useful information, I hope. Um, so Netflix is in uh, California in the Bay Area. Um, we also have a division in Hollywood um, in, uh, in Beverly, Beverly Hills, which is where we buy movies and where all of the, the uh, content deals are done. Um, and then we run all our content at Amazon, and I did actually stick the logo on the roof. But I believe this is actually an aerial view of the cloud, as most people know it. This is Amazon East, uh, as seen on Google Maps. And you can see they're building new bits, which is helpful. Um, so right now, we're supporting uh, Canada and the US as, a, as two countries that Netflix supports. Uh, we announced yesterday we have, I don't know, whatever it is, 24 million customers, almost a million of them in Canada. Um, so the next step is to take on South, South America, Latin America. This is adding another 43 countries. Who knew there were 43 countries in Latin America? It turns out there are actually 47, but we did actually bundle the last few together. Um, it's like islands with almost nobody living on them kind of things. Um, so it's one of the data explosions we have right now is that all of our metadata, which we used to have just for the US, and then, OK, well, we'll just do Canada. Now it's 45x. Uh, and every jurisdiction could potentially have, well, I want this movie, and I have a right to this movie from this TV station, but you don't. And so there's blacklists and whitelists across the whole, all 45 regions for what content is available. So it depends where you geolocate your IP to, what content you see. So that's causing a nice little data explosion internally right now, which is keeping a lot of people busy. Of course, what we're trying to do is take over the whole world. Uh, over the next few years, you'll, you'll see us getting into the rest of the world. And I drew on here the location of the Amazon um, cloud data centers that uh, are currently out there. So there's five of them in uh, East and West US, uh, Ireland, Singapore, and Japan. And this means that I can just deploy stuff whenever I want to. So this is the ultimate agility. Um, if I want to set up a test database in, in Japan, it takes me about 10 minutes. It takes me the same length of time as it takes to set up one in, uh, in the US. I don't have to ask permission. I click some buttons, and I have a 100 no Cassandra cluster running in Japan. It's just, just, I just clicked a different option when I was creating it. So that is the agility the cloud is giving us. We can make very late binding decisions on where we deploy hardware. And that, what I'm deploying there is in three data centers. I mean, everything we do is replicated three ways, and they're in three separate buildings. So this is what we couldn't have built ourselves. We're having to leverage uh, Amazon to do that. 
So let's look at the data flow. Um, I just take Hollywood as the example, and most of our content comes from Hollywood, but we're buying a lot of local TV content too. And what we do, and this, what I'm gonna do here is run through the data plane, if you like. This is the, the movie, the video content. So we take master copies of the assets from Hollywood Studios, we high quality video, multi-channel audio, and all the subtitles, all of that information, and we stick it on Amazon as master copies. Next thing we do is encode it. This uses you know, thousands and thousands of machines on EC2 to crunch through all these movies. To do a, a high def uh, video can actually take a day or more to, to just to do one encode for a long movie, for the super high def 1080p stuff. Um, there's over 50 f files per viewable, over 50 combinations of video and audio and everything. And this works out, at, it's of the order of magnitude of a petabyte of content. And I got this off somebody's blog, but it's actually something to do with OpenStack. But it was a really nice picture of a petabyte. So think of a petabyte of content sitting there that is the output from all of these, um, all of these movies, that whatever it is, tens of thousands of movies times about 50 different versions of all of the files. So to get that petabyte to the end customer, we make three more copies of it at Akamai Limelight and level three. So that's us now four petabytes of stuff sitting around uh, in various places. And what they do is feed it to the ISPs. Now, this is a, a picture from our tech blog. We keep an eye on the ISPs and see the exact performance of all of them. It's a very nice technique because if any of them suddenly dive down, you know that they're doing bad things and filtering and whatever. So they're all now very incented to be doing, getting better all the time. Um, so you can go and look this up. We're, we're gonna be publishing this about quarterly. So if you get a choice of ISPs, you can go see which one serves Netflix best. So that's the data plane. You know, big video files going through content delivery networks and being delivered out. So this is, you know, lots of number crunching uh, and, and video production. If we go back to um, the other side of the business, we actually have to have a control plane. Uh, and this, in this case, what we're doing is taking all the metadata about movies, we're doing curation, we're figuring out what the synopsis should be, translating it into, I mean, like four languages now, um, because we do Portuguese and Spanish as well as French and um, US English. And then we have, we, we actually do have French Canadian running right now um, for people that are in, in Quebec. Um, and then we also add these special tags, like you know, I particularly like goofy TV shows from the 1980s, but you know, we make up all these genres for people. So that data basically goes into a, a sort of a, an editor, and this is, a, you know, it's a very relational thing. So we actually use MySQL for this. Um, it's an internal application, and then from that we denormalize and we export to S3 as a huge number of files which are loaded into uh, into memory on any particular machine that needs to use it. So like I said, there's 45 countries worth of stuff, there's per attribute, it's a completely denormalized system because it's always flowing out. We curate the data and it flows out to the systems that need it. Um, we typically run everything, well our platform basically is Apache Tomcat, tens of gigabytes of heap, and everything runs in this Tomcat container and then we do lots of rest calls between them, which looks a little bit like this on the right. Um, you can see our web server there, um, so I just zoom in and that, that, that's our web server um, in the architecture. It says Merch Web on it and you know you can see it. We have a fairly complicated architecture. Um, there's about 150 services that we've built and several thousand machines running as a single application and everything's calling everything else. And uh, this is actually a, a screenshot from App Dynamics, which is the only way we can even track what is calling everything. You know, everything's calling everything else. Um, that generates our biggest data set is actually petabytes, many petabytes of log files that this stuff is just spewing all the time, which we are pretty bad at processing, to be honest, and there's a lot of junk in there. So we really need to be, be better at processing the logs we're generating. Um, but we use Chukwa to collect this data, um, stick it in S3, and we have a Hive system for an analyzing it. So um, a few other data sources we have. For more than 10 years, we've been collecting star ratings on movies. We have billions of them. Uh, and that's running in a MySQL system. It's been running there for many years. Uh, we, we moved that from the data center to the cloud, and we really pushed the EBS backend um, to the limit. And we decided that was the only time we were going to put MySQL in the cloud. It just was absolutely the size, size limit we could get to. 
Um, and this is a service where the site sort of runs without it. You just lose all the star ratings and everything degrades gradually. So to build something that would scale horizontally and give us the distribution we were looking for, uh, we went with uh, Cassandra. Um, this is largely driven from a need for high availability and uh, a very clean, scalable operational model. What we put in there is the membership information. So regardless of where you are in the world, you'll be able to look up, who, what, find your subscribing you know, or validate a cookie. Um, we'll be able to figure out what test cells you're in and what active devices you have. And you know, we'll be just running Cassandra across the world as we glo go global. And these will be you know, globally distributed Cassandra rings. So if I poke data in or change my data in one country, it will just flow around and that data will be visible everywhere else within about a second. We also um, store more, more complicated things in Cassandra. Uh, and one of those is the bookmark system. So you know, every time you watch a movie on Netflix, we remember where you were. Uh, in that particular viewable. If you go back to it three years later, oh yes, we still know that you were watching you know, episode three of Red Dwarf, because that was one of the first shows we ever had on Netflix about four years ago. Um, we know where you were. And um, you can go through you know, the IT crowd or whatever your favorite TV show is and remember exactly where you were in them. Um, that is growing pretty fast, because we have a lot of people watching a lot of movies all the time, and it's just building and building and building. So that's an interesting scaling problem. Um, we're also migrating a bunch of things from SimpleDB uh, and S3 based backend systems. One of those is the favorite genres, all of that kind of personalization information. And the data which you typically know as, as the queue um, is basically moving to a, a more generalized movie list system that's based on Cassandra. This is uh, you know, fairly large data sets that are growing as people watch movies, whereas the previous data set was growing as we acquire customers, which is a relatively smaller growth rate. We then take all of that data and we throw it into Hadoop. We have a large-scale Hadoop processing infrastructure. Um, and we're trying to get data into our existing business intelligence system, which runs on a Teradata. Um, and so one of the things we've been using here or looking at using is you know, currently we're sort of gluing Hadoop on top of Cassandra to suck data out of it and uh, renormalize the data. Uh, but we're actually looking at using the Brisk toolkit that was built recently to do that. So that's. Uh, you know, kind of a whirlwind tour of everything. Um, so the takeaway from this is, you know, we have a global set of data. We're scaling it on Amazon. We're rolling the whole thing out on Amazon. It's an open source-based architecture. There's lots of data, lots of bandwidth, lots of transactions, uh, and that's it. And of course, we're hiring and all that kind of stuff. But lots of interesting problems to solve here. And I managed to make a Prezi a fun shape to ready for questions. It's like traditional for a Prezi to map into some interesting shape. Any questions? Anyone out there? Anyone feeling seasick? Sorry. Do you have any plans to replace Teradata in the cloud? Do we have any plans to replace Teradata in the cloud? We're gradually whittling away at everything we have in the data center. So that group is building up its Hadoop experience, and we're moving uh, more of the data off. So the cost of storage in Teradata is about 100 times the cost of storage in the cloud. So we're, all our bulk data is in the cloud, and we're, t we're processing fairly high-end, uh, fairly well-digested data into the Teradata, where it's going through the typical you know, ab initio, microstrategy, viewing thing. And marketing and finance and whatever, they use that, and they're used to those tools. Uh, most of the product teams are getting data directly out of, um, out of Hadoop one way or another. Although I think there is a gap in the market right now for visualization tools running on Hadoop. There are a few people in that place, but I think that's a, an area where I think there's a gap right now. I think hopefully there's a, something talks here about interesting ways to do that. So data loss, OK. Um, so the question, I think, is about data loss in the cloud. Um, the way we do backup, I could probably have added a few more diagrams on this, is that the way we store data in Cassandra is a replication factor of three. We, we assign those replicas to different Amazon availability zones. So they're all in separate buildings, basically. Um, so that's three copies of the data that we can lose in a whole zone, and we still have what we, what we expect to see. Um, 
We then take backups of that. We do daily full backups and we do incremental backups. Uh, whenever Cassandra writes uh, an SS table, they're immutable files, so you can just collect, pick them up and copy them out. It's not changing data in place like a normal sort of B tree like backend. So it's already generating these immutable log files. Um, so you just copy them off to S3. Uh, and then we make, so we have an archive in wherever that Cassandra cluster is close to it that we can use to do fast restores if we need, if we need to bring back a cluster. Uh, I can actually point a script at an, at an S3-based URL, and it will create a Cassandra cluster for me immediately, you know, within about you know, 10 minutes or half an hour, depending on how much data there is in there, from a backup. I, I don't need to restore to the same cluster that I had. I can dynamically create the, the machines. We also take a copy of that data. We, um, we run it through our BI extraction so that we've got like a CSV-like output, and we're sure that we managed to restore it and we got the, uh, the data so it's no longer in a Cassandra format. It's been renormalized effectively. Um, and that proves that we had a restorable backup, and that's the data goes off into our BI system. So we take that bundle of data and we, we recompress it, re and we actually encrypt that and copy it across the country to the uh, West Coast Amazon facility and put it in a different Amazon account, um, which only has read and write and no delete permission. <laughs> and that, that's a, our second level of a backup. Um, and then we're also uh, talking to a few vendors about making an, yet another copy on an occasional basis to a different cloud vendor so that we have as much, you know, I have a slide somewhere I wrote on the, how much paranoia do you actually need? And I kind of, okay, I'm, I'm out of paranoia now that I have copies on the East Coast, the West Coast, and north and south. I've got four copies in the US and um, in two different vendors and three different accounts. I mean, that's probably enough to, uh, to not actually lose our data. Um, what we have right now is all our data sort of sitting in the data center and some guy from Man Mountain comes and takes the tapes away. You know, we're moving away from that to a much cheaper system based on S3 kind of cost of, cost of storage. Where do we store credit card data? Right now, it's actually still in the data center, but we're aggressively working to do SOX compliance and PCI compliance in the cloud. We're, we have uh, our security architect used to be a PCI auditor um, and has, has large scale experience of this stuff and we're working through that. So it's a, it's a when, not an if. And um, I trained the whole billing team in cloud architecture about two months ago. So they're banging away at that. What's the latency in the applications? Oh, in replication? Uh, Cassandra replicates stuff as fast as it can, so it's an asynchronous call. I mean, if you write bad data, you, you duplicate bad data. But we have continuous backups. So we're do, we have three levels of backup. You can do a complete dump of everything. We do the incremental SS table backup, and we also do a commit log scrape on a 30-second basis. Um, so if we corrupt data, we can co go back to, you know, we'll maybe lose 30 seconds of data. So architecturally, that's what we've done. Now, this is all stuff that we developed in-house. We're currently working with data stacks to open source the, um, the code for doing that. It's called uh, Priam, I think. Everything is like a Greek name. So I think that's called Priam, which was Cassandra's father or something. Um, so there's a, and over the next few weeks, we're hoping to get that out of the open source community and then get the um, Cassandra community to pick that up as the basis of a, a more generalized backup and restore and incremental archiving system. It's, so with Hadoop, we primarily use it for a high, as a hive store. We don't do much HBase. We've uh, done a few things, you know, playing around with HBase, but um, we're primarily using it as a, as a hive store, and we use Amazon EMR to create, you know, we have several hundred nodes of, of Hadoop cluster, and we create them on demand as we need to. So most of our data storage is actually in S3. Need to kick me off? Out of time, okay. All right, thanks so much. I'll be around for the rest of the conference.